Number 17, for each differential equation, determine whether x equal to 0 is an ordinary point, regular singular point, or irregular singular point. So if we have a second order differential equation, and uh, if you have uh, some vanishing coefficient at, uh, of y double prime, that's a singular point. So for example, if you have x equal to 0, then suddenly 0 times y double prime, the y double prime vanishes, right? It makes this differential equation somewhat differently behaving at x equal to 0 than other places. So in that case, we call it singular. But there are two types of singularity. Uh, one is regular singular, another is irregular singular. One where you can use the Frobenius method, the other you can't. So it's important to distinguish these two different singularities. And that's what this question is about. Now, to see if uh, you have a regular point or a singular point, you uh, ordinary point or, or a singular point, uh, you want to divide by the coefficient of x squared and see what you have. If you have like fractions like this where, where x is undefined, that's uh, that immediately means that, oh, this is not an ordinary point. It's a singular point. x equal to 0 will make these undefined. Therefore, it's called singular. Uh, I mean, if one of them fails, it's singular. Okay. In this case, both of them fails. Uh, but even if you, just one of them fails, it's singular. All right. Now, how do you know if it's a regular singular or irregular singular? You uh, define lowercase px as x times capital px. You multiply x to this one. And for lowercase qx, you multiply x squared to this one. And you look at them. Now, if those are well defined at x equal to 0, then it's a good thing. Then it means it's a regular singular. However, look at the following example. Um, this time you divide by x squared, you do see that uh, x squared is here, x is there, so uh, it is singular. But this time when you go to p lowercase px and lowercase qx, qx is okay, but this px is negative 5 over x, so at x equal to 0, this lowercase px is undefined. And in that case, it's a bad thing. That means we can't use the Frobenius method. In that case, we say it's an irregular singularity. Now, here's a case where you have an ordinary. If you have a negative 5 y double prime, if you divide, you see that these are fractions, but the denominator is never 0, so these are always defined. In that case, it's an ordinary point. Okay. All right. Number 18. Solve the initial value problem x squared plus 3y double prime plus 2y prime plus y equal to 0 with these initial conditions. Find the recurrence relation and the first five non-zero terms of the solution. All right. When you are looking for power series solution, this is what you write. That's the power series uh, with coefficients a0, a1, a2, and so and so. If you differentiate this, if you differentiate x to the end, the power rule says n comes down and you have to subtract 1, so that's what you have. And because when n is 0, gives it, this thing becomes 0, you should make n start from 1. Same thing over here. You have uh, n minus 2. If you differentiate n minus 1, that n minus 1 climbs down and you get n times n minus 1. And in this case, even for n equal to 0 and then n equals to 1, they're both equal to 0, so you have to make your summation start from n equals to 2. Now, we plug these into our given differential equation. However, you have to be careful because uh, when you plug it in, and if you have something uh, more than two terms, two or more terms multiplied to a single term, then you have to multiply them out so that uh, you only have x squared you, you only have, uh, uh, I guess these are called uh, uh, monomials. Yeah, so you, you only have monomials, yeah, just like this. You don't have any additions in there. So, so anything you can expand, just expand before you plug in. So we plug in, and so this, this is what you get. And then these coefficients that's in front of the sigma can be brought inside. x squared times x to the n minus 2, that's uh, 2 plus n minus 2, that gives you x to the n. 3 goes inside, 2 goes inside, everything's the same. Now, 
if you look at this, I see that uh, you have n minus 2 here and then n minus 1 here. So uh, these are different than x to the n, right? So we have to shift this term and also this term so that everything has x to the nth power. Now let's see how that's done. Uh, so first, you know, let's try to shift this one. To make this to, as x to the n, we have to uh, replace n by n plus 2, so that n plus 2 minus 2 will become two, uh, just, just n, right? That means every n in here, this n, this n, this n, even this n, all of them has to be replaced by n plus 2. So if we replace everything by n plus 2, we have n plus 2 equals to 2, n plus 2, n plus 2 minus 1, n plus 2, n plus 2 minus 2. And then if you simplify, this is what you get. Uh, here, n plus 2 equals to 2. If you solve for n, that means n equals to 0, right? This is called the shifting of the previous one. And uh, it matches the powers of x to the n so that you can combine different summations. Likewise, you can also uh, shift this and uh, replace n by n plus 1, and that makes it to turn into this. Okay. After the shifting, this is what we have. Oops. This is what we have. We have these terms. Now, look at this. See that these three start to produce terms when starting from n equal to 0, but then this one starts late, right? It only activates when n is 2n afterwards. So what you do is uh, you want to write down the terms you get when n is equal to 0. Uh, so there's nothing coming from here when n is 0. So if you plug in 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, this is what you get. If you plug in 1 here, 1 here, 1 here, this is what you get as x to the first power. But then afterwards, everything is producing terms, so you can write it as n equals to 2 to infinity of, uh, you can combine all the others into a single thing. And the reason we do that is because there's a theorem in mathematics which says that if this is equal to 0 over some interval of x, so if, if, for, if this is equal to 0 for any value of x, then the only way that's possible is when e each individual coefficient of x is 0. So this has to be 0, that has to be 0, that has to be 0. And notably, this last thing here uh, gives you something called the recurrence relation for the, the coef coefficients. All right. So let's write down what we get if we put as 0. So we get this as 0, this as 0, and this as 0. And this is true for n 2 or greater because you can see that this summation starts from 2, 2 or greater. Uh, if, if you have this, you should always solve for the highest order, right? So this is a of n plus 2. That's the highest. This is n. That's n plus 1. This is the highest, right? So we solve this. So move everything else to the other side, just like this. And now you divide by this. This is something that holds for n2 or greater, and that's called the recurrence relation. All right. Another important thing is that uh, we had this initial condition, right? Initial condition y of 0 equals negative 1 and y prime of 0 equal to 1. That if you work it out, you'll see that it means that, uh, uh, where am I? Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, that means, the initial condition means a0 equal to negative 1 and a1 equal to 1. And uh, plugging those in here, you get the value of a2 and a3 from first 2. So this will be solved for a2 to give you negative 1, 6. This can be solved for a3. Uh, to give you negative 1 over 54. And uh, because we are looking for five non-zero terms, we need a0, a1, a2, a3, a4. So a4 is what we need. To get the a4, we need to put 2 in here and then plug in the values you found. And if you do all the calculation, you get 11 over 648. And therefore, finally, the answer is that y is this type of function. You can uh, go further uh, if you want. Uh, then all you have to do is, uh, uh, for the next one, you just plug in 3 into n, you solve this, you get a5, a6, a7, and so on and so on. Okay? So theoretically, this can be uh, calculated up to like 1,000 terms. If you're using a computer, uh, you can do that and get an approximate uh, idea of what uh, this solution looks like. Okay?
All right. Last question, number 19. Find the Frobenius type solution for 3x squared y double prime plus 8xy prime plus x squared plus 2y equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, find the recurrence relation and the first five non-zero terms of the solution. To solve this, you should divide by 3x squared to get this, and you have to find uh, uh, what lowercase px is and lowercase qx is by multiplying. After you find out uh, lowercase qx and lowercase px, you have to evaluate at 0. So this should be 0, and you get these two numbers, 8 over 3 and 2 over 3, right? The reason you want these is that there's something for the initial equation for Frobenius, so, uh, Frobenius method, which is always this form, r times r minus 1 plus p0, p evaluated as 0, plus q evaluated as 0. So plugging these into the initial equation gives you this. Let's solve this. You just multiply them out and solve. And if you solve this, uh, you get negative 2 over 3 and negative 1. Now for these, uh, for each of these exponents, negative 2 thirds and negative 1, you can find the Frobenius type solution. Uh, here we will just work on with negative 1. Uh, but if you want more practice, you can also try out the solution coming from negative 2 thirds. Okay, for negative 1, since this is our Frobenius type solution, we replace r by negative 1, and this is what you get. You can include this negative 1 inside, and you get x to the n minus 1. Okay? So you get y equals to this, and then if you differentiate, you get y prime equals to this, this n minus 1 comes down, and you have x to the n minus 2. So that's your y prime. Differentiate again. This is y double prime. One important important difference be between uh, the Frobenius method and regular par series method is that when you differentiate, you don't start from n equals to 1. You still start from 0. That's because even if you plug in 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1. So this doesn't become 0. And therefore, uh, you still have to plug start from n equal to 0. Same story here. When n is 0, this is not 0. Therefore, you do re need to put n equals to 0 here. Okay, let's continue. All right, so... All this is just uh, plugging in. Oh, uh, again, you have to expand this before plugging in. You plug everything in, and then uh, you have to shift somewhere. I see that this is x to the n plus 1, whereas the other ones are n minus 1. So we shift this by replacing n by n minus 2. That's why we got this. And then you look at the final version. You see every uh, the first two and the last one starts from n equal to 0, whereas this one only starts activating uh, when uh, it's activated when n is 2 and afterwards, right? So we have to, by hand, figure out what terms are produced when a, n is equal to 0. It's this one. And also when n is equal to 1. And then afterwards, we can come... Oh, this, this is typo. This should be 2. 2 and afterwards, this should be combined. Okay, so... Um, you combine it to a single thing, and again set each one of them as zero. Now, uh, this one is always zero, right? Six minus a plus two is zero, so this is always zero. And that's a good thing. That that says that a zero can be anything. Uh, if you force a zero to be zero, then the the recurrence relation will force the later ones to be zero, and it's a it's a bad thing to happen. So you really want a zero to be not zero. Always in, in Frobenius method, you never want a0 to be 0. Okay, so that's what we have. However, here you only have 2a1, and that has to be 0, so we, we, get, we deduce that a1 is equal to 0. a1 equal to 0 is okay. It just means that uh, uh, if you plug it in, uh, you'll see that uh, this, this thing forces a3 to be 0. Uh, when you plug in uh, n equals to 3 here, you'll see that n, a, a3 is 0, and then a5 will be 0. Uh, because this recurrence relation kind of relates the a n with a n minus 2, the two terms that are 2 apart, uh, if a 1 is 0, it will make uh, a 3 0 and then a 5 0 and so on and so on. Okay? And then uh, uh, we know that this should be equal to 0. That should give us the recurrence relation. Let's solve for a higher number, which is a n. n is bigger than n minus 2, right? So we have to solve for a n. If you solve, you get uh, this, and it should for it should hold for n two or greater. And then uh, here's another important part. Uh, 
if you apply this for n equals to 2, you get a2 equals to 1 over 2 times 3 times 2 is 6, 6 minus 1 is 5, 5 times 2 is 10. So this is what you get. So this is very straightforward. However, if you look at a4, a4 with uh, n being 4, 4 times uh, 11 gives you 44. It, it's very easy to stop here and think that you have, you, you have what a4 should be. But that's not what we should stop at because a2 is indeed negative 10, 1 over 10. So you have to replace a2 by this. That's an important step a lot of people miss, okay? So uh, you have to plug in what you know to get uh, the full idea of what A4 is. Same story with A6. A6 is something times A4. You have to plug that back in here to get what A6 is. And when you get the A6, you have to use it to find out what A8 is. And then if you have them, you get the A08. Uh, you basically have all uh, five non-zero terms if you have this, okay? What I did here is I pulled out the a0 out, out, and this is x to the r with r equals to the negative 1. So your answer should be in this form. Yeah, so uh, again, a lot of you forget to put these coefficients into the final solution. If you don't have the final solution, this means nothing. You got all these bunch of numbers, but what are you going to do with it, right? But here, this actually tells you what kind of function the solution of the differential equation is. So it's a much better thing to have.